Good morning and welcome to today's lesson. For today's lesson we'll be looking at liver function and diagnosis. What is the liver? The liver is the largest organ in the human body and it lies below the diaphragm. This weighs about two to three pounds and it can be divided into four lobes. The main blood vessels that that transport and take away blood away from the liver is the hepatic artery and the portal vein. The liver is capable of regeneration, so if you have a damaged liver, it can be easily reversible. And this is this is a quite a key point about the liver that any damage is reversible and it's able to regenerate. It has many functions, as we'll see in the next few slides, and it is the site of many diseases. So functions of the liver. So this is carried out by the liver cells, which are also known as hepatocytes. These play a major role in metabolism and metabolic pathways such as glycolysis and Krebs cycles, which, which results in the production of ATP for energy, and this is carried out in hepatocytes. The liver is also a store for glycogen and it processes fats and proteins from digested foods. It also makes proteins which are essential for blood clotting and processes medicines such as paracetamol, etc. It also removes or processes alcohol, poisons or toxins, and it can produce and excrete bile, which is an alkaline compound which aids digestion. With regards to liver function tests, these are clinical biochemistry laboratory blood tests, and these determine the state of a patient's liver. However, it is important to note that it is not a quantitative measure, and it can detect the presence and follow the progress of liver disease. When liver function tests are requested, you will get results for enzymes, bilirubin and other proteins. These results can assist in finding out whether you have a biliary, biliary tract obstruction or acute and chronic disease. So these are two examples of enzymes involved in liver function tests and they are called AST and ALT, aspartate aminotransferase and alanine aminotransferase. So these are both present in cells and leak into the blood when the cells are injured. The enzyme activity can be measured and it is widely used in clinical practice. These are sensitive but non-specific markers of liver cell damage and you will see these usually affected in hepatitis, toxic injury due to drug overdose such as paracetamol poisoning, acute liver damage due to shock. Another enzyme involved in liver function tests is alkaline phosphatase, ALP, and this is present in cells lining the biliary ducts. This is involved in coleostasis, which is a blockage of the bioflow. And but however, it's important to know that liver is not the only source of alkaline phosphatase, as this is also present in the bone, small intestine, and in the placenta during the third trimester of pregnancy and the kidney. Alkaline phosphatase levels are tend to be increased when while children are growing. Another one is called glamour glutamyl transferase, and this is widely distributed in tissues, including the liver and the kidney. This, at, this enzyme is increased when there is coleostasis, as well as alkaline phosphatase in the previous slide, and it is also affected by ingestion of alcohol. So when you have drank alcohol, your GGT level, your gamma GT levels will be increased. So this is alcohol and other drugs such as phenytonin, which is anti-epileptic, induces enzyme activity. So moving on to bilirubin, which results in the biopigment. This is derived from heme, which is mainly found in hemoglobin. This is insoluble in water and is transported in a blood bound to albumin. And at this point, it is unconjugated. This is then taken up by the liver cells, also known as hepatocytes, and becomes conjugated, which is more soluble. Conjugated bilirubin is then excreted into bile. So unconjugated bilirubin becomes conjugated bilirubin which then gets excreted into bile. Unconjugated is not soluble, is insoluble in water and conjugated is soluble in water. So this is a symptom that arises due to increased levels of bilirubin in the bloodstream. And this means that you have yellow discoloration of the skin. And you can see this in your eyes as well sometimes and your nails. And it's not usually detectable until bilirubin concentration is greater than or equal to 40 micro micromolar per litre. The difference range being 3 to 22. So jaundice can arise due to various reasons. So the first one is, is hemolysis. So increased hemoglobin breakdown results in bilirubin, which overloads the conjugating mechanism. This is this is commonly encountered in babies, and it's neurotoxic. So high levels in babies can result in brain damage. It's increased levels of bilirubin in neonate can, should be carefully monitored. 
and phototherapy is used to break down the bilirubin if it's le uh, greater than 200 micromolars per litre. So the reference level is normally 3 to 22. So the second reason that jaundice can occur is due to failed conjugation. So that's a result of hepatocellular damage. And the most common causes of acute jaundice as a result of hepatocellular damage is usually viral hepatitis and paracetamol poisoning. And there's also increased levels of AST and ALT, which, which suggest hepatocellular damage. The final reason that jaundice can occur is due to biliary obstruction, also known as coleostasis. So gallstones can partially or fully block the bile duct, and if the, if the blockage is complete, the bilirubin and ALP levels are increased. However, if it's a partial blockage, the bilirubin can be within the normal reference range of 3 to 22. So these are the three reasons that jaundice can occur. Biliary obstruction, hepatocellular damage, and unconjugated bilirubin levels. So looking at proteins associated with the liver, one of them is known as albumin, which is a major protein product of the liver. This is a long biological half-life around approximately 20 days. And low albumin is a feature of advanced chronic liver disease. Another one is also alpha fetoprotein, which is synthesized by the fetal liver. And this has got a low level in normal adults. High levels occur in liver cancer, which is also known as hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's a marker for germ, germ cell tumour. So paracetamol poisoning. Let's look at paracetamol poisoning. So this is metabolised by, by the liver in small amounts. This results in toxic metabolites which are present in high concentrations. So for the first 24 hours, there will be no symptoms, so it's asymptomatic. Or there will be no specific symptoms such as nausea or vomiting. The liver cells or hepatocytes may then be destroyed after 24 hours. And this can progress to acute liver failure. Maximum liver damage usually occurs three to four days after ingestion, and this can result in encephalopathy, hypoglycemia, and renal failure. So, investigating paracetamol poisoning. So, serum paracetamol is greater than four hours at post ingestion. You should conduct urea and electrolytes tests to look for renal failure. Liver functions tests such as ALT to see if there's liver, severe liver damage. Plasma glucose with hypoglycemia is common when liver cells are destroyed. Arterial blood glasses, because acidosis can occur at an early stage, and this is a poor sign, and in prothrombin time, to the time taken for blood clotting to occur in a sample of blood, and this indicates how severe the liver failure is. With regards to treatment of paracetamol poisoning, activated charcoal, if it's ingested within the previous hour, acetylcysteine, commonly known as an antidote, which is most effective if given within eight hours, and patients at risk of liver damage and acquiring treatment can be identified by the paracetamol treatment graph. So both bacteria and viruses can give rise to infective hepatitis. So hepatitis is defined as inflammation of the liver. There are three most common types, hepatitis A, B, and C. With regards to hepatitis A, this is transmitted by eating and drinking in places of poor hygiene. With regards to B, this is passed on through bodily fluids. In regards to C, this is through contact with someone with infected blood. And this results in elevated aminotransferase activities. So your ALT and ALT levels will be increased in these conditions. So let's have a look at inadequate perfusion. So this is poor flow of fluid into the liver. And this results in hypovolemic shock. And that occurs when the volume of the circulatory system is too diminished to allow adequate circulation to this tissue in the body. So a healthy adult can withstand loss of 0 0.5 litres from a circulation of about 5 litres. Causes of this can result from loss of blood due to trauma or sepsis bacteria in the blood, and where the blood pressure drops to a dangerously low level as a result of infection. So we mentioned previously about acute liver disease and chronic liver disease, so let's have a look at this. So acute liver disease can be caused by poisoning, infection, and inadequate perfusion. So paracetamol poisoning, infection via hepatitis, bacterial infections, and inadequate perfusion, hypovolemic shock, and there's no fluid coming out of the liver. This does progress in three ways. It can resolve and go back to normal, which it does in the majority of cases. It can resolve to acute hepatic failure. It can lead to a chronic hepatic damage, long-term liver damage. Yeah. But can also progress to short-term liver failure. 
continue on with acute liver failure. This is a major medical emergency. Metabolic functions of the liver cannot be compensated for by any organ. And this can give, this can give rise to renal failure, such as kidney being exposed to toxins. This leads to decreased albumin synthesis, leading to hypoalbuminia, which is low albumin levels, and oedema, as well as increased or decreased level of ascites. This can result in increased risk of hemorrhage, as well as clotting factors not being synthesised, which would affect your blood clotting. And the recovery can take many weeks, and it is, for this, it is useful to monitor liver function tests to see how it relapses and the prognosis. Regards to chronic liver disease, this can be a result from three reasons. Chronic alcohol ingestion, long-term alcohol drinking, active hepatitis B, and autoimmune disease. And that is where the immune system makes antibodies against parts of the body. So an example is, of disease is primary biliary cirrhosis. And this is a slow, progressive destruction of the bile duct. And this can progress to cirrhosis, which is scarring of the liver. And a common symptom this is low albumin and of advanced chronic liver disease. So, with regards to alcohol, which can damage the liver, this is absorbed into the bloodstream from stomach and intestines, and this passes through the liver before circulating around the body. Highest concentration is in the blood flow flowing through the liver, and the liver cells or hepatocytes contain enzymes which metabolize alcohol. Cells can possess only a certain amount per hour. And this can lead to fatty liver, hepatitis, and cirrhosis. Any or all of this can occur at the same time, and this can result in liver failure. So take note to all of those who, all of you who are listening, who love to drink quite a lot. You know, this is what will happen eventually in the end if it just doesn't stop. So looking at cirrhosis, this is characterised by extensive liver fibrosis, and fibrosis is the formation of scar tissue. This can progress slowly, and often there are no early symptoms. Symptoms appear such as jaundice, increased bilirubin, remember, leading to the yellowing of the eye, skin, nails, etc., and ascites and bleeding in the terminal stages. Cirrhosis, unfortunately, is not reversible. So, you know, we said that liver has the ability to regenerate. Once it gets to this stage, cirrhosis is not reversible, and this can lead to end stage liver disease. This is commonly caused by alcohol and hepatitis C, which are the most common causes of this in the UK. And, but just to, just to clarify here, hepatitis B is the most common cause worldwide. So in the UK, it's hepatitis C, but worldwide it's hepatitis B, the contact of body fluids. And less common causes include inherited diseases. So diagnosis of cirrhosis is based on symptoms, examination, and history, alcohol history, see how much of a drinker you are. Liver function tests are often normal, and blood tests may be done to check for hepatitis and other causes. Ultrasound or CT scans can determine whether a liver is shrunk or abnormally patterned, and a biopsy may be required if diagnosis is still uncertain. Other liver problems can arise as well. So a common site of secondary metastasis is from tumours, and jaundice can be the first indication of the presence of cancer. So primary hepatocellular cancer, so primary liver cancer, is a malignant tumour of the liver, and there will be a video coming on that regarding cancers and the different types of benign and malignant, etc., and metastasis. And this is associated with hep hepatitis and cirrhosis. As I mentioned before about alpha fetal protein, this is often produced as well, which is a useful biochemical marker. And this is increased at diagnosis in 70% of patients' primary liver carcinomas. This is also increased to an extent in hepatitis and cirrhosis. And a final point I want to touch upon is inherited liver diseases such as hemochromatosis, uh, hemochromatosis, and uh, yeah. So this results in iron absorption and mutation of the HFE gene. So it's important to know that there are inherited liver diseases which can occur, such as hemochromatosis, and as well, else another one as well, quite quite known as is uh, Welch's disease. So that's the end of the video today. Please let me know what you thought of it. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and also. Leave a comment in the section below. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to the next video. Thank you.